Okay, so uh, let's start. Um, we are quite a few, so if you have any questions or doubts, just tell me. Uh, if you already know something about Android programming, it's the time to take a rest and go away and maybe see you on uh, next week's, because this is going to be uh, by force a very high level, very introductory, because we have just one hour and a half. We cannot learn any, almost anything about Android, and that's the basis. Okay, but yes, let's try. So this is a disclaimer. So in summary, what, what I would try to do today is a part uh, of a short history about the Android op operating system uh, is to give you some information about the architecture, uh, some information about the tool chain that you can exploit for, for developing Android applications with other main components, uh, especially uh, concerning the, the kind of components and the life cycle of components so that you can at least start understanding why something is behaving uh, in, in a given way instead of uh, in the way you expect, for example. Um, and to have some hands on, on uh, very simple applications, uh, starting from scratch, uh, trying to get, you know, to understand what is the life cycle of an activity and so on, and uh, try to, to make the application a little bit more complex up to uh, a REST client for, uh, for our music REST server which is uh, far from being complete or compliant with any guidelines, so, so this is just for teaching purposes, nothing more, but at least it is something a little bit more complex. So, um, some very short history. Um, Android. Android actually uh, was born like an initiative for creating an open source uh, smartphone system, which was initiated by Andy Robin some years ago about 10, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. Um, it was acquired at some point in 2005 by Google. And since then, there have been many stable releases starting, okay, the, the most notable are uh, starting from Freud, which, which is the 2.2 version and going up uh, to the current one, which is 5.1, uh, I think. No, no more 5.0, is 5.1, which is coming. And Okay, this is just an informative table to show what are the, the, the distribution. And what's interesting is the actually the distribution between customers. So when we start developing Android, like the applications, we need to think also about the compatibility with past versions. And if we have a look at the table, what we can learn from the table is that currently the relative majority of devices are running Android KitKat, 40% nearly, but still there is a, a relevant part of devices running Jelly Bean and uh, uh, 4.x uh, versions, and still there are at least 15% uh, of devices which are running lower versions. So when we start developing an, uh, an application, we need to account that. We need to figure out w which is the audience and if we want to get a bigger spread, we need to develop something which is backward compatible. Okay, so that, that, that's the main goal of this slide, just to keep in mind that the latest APIs are not the, uh, do not correspond to the widest diffusion of devices, of course. Okay, so some other figures which are still in, uh, in the history level. Um, why Android and not uh, iOS, for example? Okay, first, because iOS, uh, you know, uh, requires an SDK that needs to be paid. And that's a strong motivation in a university. Uh, the second motivation is that actually both iOS and Android are the two platforms which cover almost 90% uh, of the market, let's say. So by learning Android, we can claim that at least we can take all, a good part of the market of smartphones. And this good part now amounts of some million of mobile terminals. So that, that's the user base. Uh, spread over 190 countries in the world. Um, why these uh, initiatives survived? Uh, since uh, uh, differently from the iOS part, all the terminals are different, many brands involved and so on. It survived because there are actually 
uh, agreements between companies to, to stick to the, to the Android system and standard. And these agreements cover over 300 different hardware software and carrier partners. So yes, it's not a single brand, but it's a, uh, a consortium of brands working on it. So that's why it's still alive. And just to give you an idea of what, what can be the market of an Android app, not ours probably, or maybe yes, I don't know. Not mine for sure. Um, or better, all the Android users nearly download 1.5 billion apps per month. So if you just count on 0 0.5 euros per app per month, you can easily make the calculation. Okay. So it might be a revenue, a strong revenue also. Okay. So given the history and the motivation, very quick, let's go to the architecture. Um, what is the Android system? Actually, it's a Linux. It's based on the Linux kernel. So this is a Linux-based system. Okay. Um, we don't see the, the Linux running behind the lines, but it's there, and it handles all the low-level tasks. Uh, upon Linux, there is a set of tools and platforms um, that, on the user hand, let's say, um, are uh, made evident through uh, wonderful UIs, at least according to Google. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, the, the really interesting thing is that when they decided to work on Android, they decided to, instead of developing a new language from scratch, to adopt one of the most diffused language at that time, and still now, which is Java. The Android system is not executing Java, actually. It's executing other language. But the development of application uses the, the Java language syntax, which enables by default, all Java developers to deal with Android application. And that was the choice uh, that was successful for getting a, a wide community of developers very quickly. Differently, for example, from iOS, where they have a dedicated language for that, which is Objective-C and its derivation. OK. Um, currently, Android is running, or is referring to uh, Version 6 of Java, actually version 7 from Android Lollipop, so the, from the latest Android uh, version. Um, and it can now use a 64-bit kernel on multiprocessors. So these phones are more and more becoming like computers. So latest phones have at, have at least four cores. There are some phones starting with eight cores, two gigabytes of RAM, and so on. This is more a laptop than a smartphone, right? Um, and actually, inside the smartphone, there is a real operating system running. Um, this is the general architecture. We don't learn everything, but this is just to give you an idea of uh, how is organized the, organization, uh, the architecture of a, of a smartphone based on Android. You have here in red the kernel. These are uh, the, the lowest part of the, of the operating system. They are Linux-based, and they basically deal with uh, hardware devices. So there are there all the drivers for the camera, for the sensor on board, accelerometer, NFC reader, and so on. All the stuff related to power management, to the management of the touch screen, of the uh, or uh, whatever <laughs> technology display, and so on. This is carried at the operating system level, the Linux level. Then up on, on this level, there are libraries which are still partly developed in C, okay? Um, and they are those green blocks, and they provide a, a little bit higher level functionalities. For example, there, there are libraries for uh, providing support to web browsers, like WebKit, uh, libraries for rendering graphics, OpenGL in the mobile version, so that we can have 3D graphics on the mobile terminal. Uh, APIs for handling security, uh, for uh, supporting uh, data storage, and so on and so on. Okay, so we have base drivers, base system, plus libraries. 
And this is somewhat legacy or native. And this part actually can be also accessed by the developer, but these developers are those using the so-called native development kit. So in Android, you can go down to the system level and develop tools for the system level part of the phone, but in that case, you need to use C language and the libraries specifically defined for the Android system. On the other hand, you have the right part of the figure, which is this Android runtime, which is in yellow, that is basically composed of two main components. One is a virtual machine, like the Java virtual machine, and the other is a set of core libraries. Starting from this up, all blue elements are Java-based things. The virtual machine is the component that takes care of getting the Java syntax or something that comes from the Java syntax and transforming it into something executable on the platform. Okay, it is a little bit more complex and I go in a little bit more detail afterwards, but that's the idea. Uh, the virtual machine supports the Java-based language development. Upon this, this is pure Java. They are provided, they are, there are a set of libraries, a set of functions provided uh, by the development tools and already available inside the platform, inside the, uh, the mobile phone, but they are still, uh, based on Java, they can be understood by Java developers, so they, they can be interfaced. So it's really easy to, to, to access the, the, the programming part if you know the Java language, of course. But the base of Java-enabled developers is really large. That's why they, they selected this kind of language. Um, okay, and in between these blue levels, there are actually two second layers. The lowest one is based on the, is, is providing the application framework, so all the services that can be exploited by an application. Among these, there are, for example, services for managing different activities, so different applications running on the phone, the, the systems for uh, supporting different views, so organization of elements on the interface, uh, different interface elements, and so on. There are also other uh, uh, tools named Manager, which allow uh, to uh, have an easier management of particular things like uh, there is a notification manager for handling at the system level notification. So when you got a notification on your mobile phone, the notification manager of the Android system is actually handling that notification. And the same happens, for example, for the location. There is a location manager who is able to perform what is called data fusion between uh, the GPS sensor on board plus the Wi-Fi plus whatever else to give you a position that might be more or less precise depending on the current hardware system who is providing the, the positioning. But still at the application level, there is just one location manager to interface. And then you may specify, for example, the accuracy you need. And depending on that, the manager might decide to turn on the GPS or not. Okay, so there, there are, these are modules which are in between the, the developer and the hardware and make the life easier. And the same happens, for example, for the telephony manager who manages phone calls, so that, for example, you can just really start a call with two lines of code, because that's that manager there. And at the top level, there are your applications, my application, the application of developers, let's say. Um, that can be about uh, almost any domain. So you can have application for calling, you can replace one important principle in Android is that every application can be replaced. So you can write your own caller application and replace the, the, the default one, um, and the same for uh, the contact application and so on, which is a bit different from other systems where the core application are uh, blocked, let's say. Uh, yet, if you have uh, a branded phone with a branded ROM, you might not be able to remove the, the standard applications because the, you know, the, the vendor blocks those core applications. But in principle, they can, okay? So if you got a stock Android, a pure Android from Google, you should be able to remove a good part of the core applications, if you want, <laughs> okay. So a bit more about the virtual machine. What is a virtual machine is a 
let's say uh, when we started with programming, we said there are uh, interpreted programs and compiled programs. What does a virtual machine is to act uh, like an intermediate interpreter. So there is a first compiler that translates the, lang the, the code written in any language, in this case Java, into a, um, intermediate call code, which is uh, not real, uh, really platform dependent, but still like a binary code in a sense. And this intermediate code is then fed to a virtual machine that interprets the code and runs the code against the hardware, okay? So the, 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 the last part of the compilation is done by the virtual machine. So that you can write in a language which is independent in the hand from the platform because there are different virtual machines on per each platform. The same happens on Android. But the virtual machine works a little bit different. I don't go into the details because we need to know how a virtual machine works internally. Uh, the only things to note is that it's a different from the Java virtual machine, for example, uh, for the internal principle of working. So this works based on registers, okay? But uh, the other thing to note is that um, this is an optimized mach virtual machine so that it can run application on uh, resource-constrained devices. This is no more true, they are not so resource-constrained, but in the, in the beginning, they were really constrained, much uh, less uh, powerful than a laptop. Okay, so the, the virtual machine should be optimized. There are, if you want more information, there are pointers there. And the other difference which is important to remember is that even if we program in Java, the bytecode, so the intermediate code interpreted by the virtual machine is not Java intermediate code. So what does the, the, the first compiler, it's a cross compiling is. It's taking one language that we know, one language syntax, and compiling into completely different bytecode. So you think that you are programming in Java and the, syntax. And the libraries, of course. Um, and also related to this, there is no just-in-time compilation, which is one of the features of the Java platform that is based to the compilation on the fly when you are running the application. Compilation is carried at the beginning, at the first application run. Then afterwards, every time you launch the application, you launch the binary version. Instead for Java, compilation happens at every time, more or less. Um, what are Android programs? They are basically the, the result of the compilation of these intermediate files, uh, and they're are using this Dalvik execute, executable format, which is an extension .dex, and which is usually zipped into an APK package, which is the one you download from the Play Market, for example. So you are used to, to download APK files for installing application. Yeah, they are actually zip file containing the executable. Um, and these particularly uh, particular executable files are also designed to uh, take low space on the memory, okay, so that uh, you can have multiple applications running on a device which has low memory in principle. Um, and even if you try to uncompressing uh, this APK file, also the executable file is usually much um, is usually uh, taking much less space than, uh, for example, uh, a corresponding Java file, jar file, okay? So that this means basically, in the hand, that the code we generate is much more optimized because it needs to be run on, uh, on a device which is not powerful. Okay, so just, we already said something about the, the framework and the manager we have, just as a, a, a quick overview of on the many APIs we can exploit. We can exploit APIs for calling, so telephony APIs, for playing media, audio or video, uh, accelerated using the, the hardware drivers, basically. Um, sensors, typically uh, low-hand devices have at least the accelerometer on board. The highest-hand devices have also uh, luminosity sensors, NFC readers, uh, and so on. Location, browser, maps from Google, peer-to-peer uh, -peer and Google Talk APIs, 
When I use the word API, it means that we have libraries for using or for interfacing these functions that are supposed to be easier to handle. So we, need, we don't need to develop anything from scratch because we have the support at least. Um, and, and so on and so on, up to graphical widgets, characters, uh, databases, and so on. So it's a full platform with, let's say, all support to develop really effective applications. So, you can say much more. We can just deserve two lessons on this, but let's go over and try to, to quickly get onto hands-on part, but um, what we need to, to start developing. Someone on you already knows, but let's, let's try to list at least um, the minimum set of tools we need. First, we are developing in Java. So we need a Java compiler, okay? Um, or a Java development toolkit. And this is the Java SDK provided by Oracle now. It was Sun some years ago, now it's Oracle. Um, on Android, the, the Java version is uh, six for almost all uh, platforms, and it's now seven for Lollipop and subsequent ones. Uh, actually, the syntax uh, doesn't change really much between six and seven, there are uh, small changes. So if you write uh, Java 6 code, basically it's compatible with Java 7. The contrary is not always true, okay? Um, then you need the Android SDK, which is the set of libraries and support tools for working with the Android uh, development. And you need also an environment to develop. We, we know, for example, uh, that in Python we use the Eclipse integrated development environment. We can still use Eclipse for Android. There is a plugin for that, which is named ADT, Android Development Tools. It was the reference development environment for, uh, for Android until, uh, I think, two years ago. Afterwards, Google uh, took uh, an agreement with the IntelliJ, JetBrain, which is another brand of uh, producing uh, development environments. So since two years, two or three years, the reference environment is the Android Studio One, which is the one uh, we, we use in this lesson and which is the one uh, I, I saw many of you use in the lab. So let's use it since it's the reference. Um, then uh, with these three first tools, you can do almost the development, all the development part, but you need to have something to test what you develop. And this something to test can either be a real device, which you need to connect via USB to the laptop, and this is good if you want to throw out your device after the development part, because you get the device always connected to USB, always running up, never sleeping. Okay, so the, the second option is to, and also you are still developing just for one device. So maybe there's some uh, cases in which you develop an application, you test it on your mobile phone, then you get the application, you lend it to your best friend, and the application doesn't work because the phone has a different API level support, different characteristics, and so on. So one of the things we need to, to make sure when we develop applications for Android is to test the applications on, at least on different platform levels. To do that, we need some tool which is a little bit more structured than just using a mobile phone, unless you have you know, the buying power for getting 10 different smartphones. Uh, so the solution is usually to use an emulator. An emulator is a program that simulates the hardware platform and the software stack which is running on the platform. And there can be either soft, pure software emulators or uh, emulators which are running on virtual machines, which are still software, but the difference is that the, firm, the, the former are uh, slower than the latter. While because the ladder really emulates the, 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 the hardware behind the line behind the, the, the software stack, and it, it usually exploits uh, systems which are designed for emulating machines, like VirtualBox, for example. So uh, between the two choices, usually what are called the native images are faster, and typically, if you use the Android 
provided emulator, it is slower than other third-party emulators based on virtualization. For example, in this lesson, I will use Genymotion, which is a third-party emulator, which has the ability to run VirtualBox images of devices. And the main advantage with respect to a native emulator provided by, the, by, by Google is that basically it is faster. Also, if you are not running uh, an Intel-based machine, because there are particular emulators optimized for Intel-based machines, but might be you are not running an Intel-based computer, like a Mac, for example, I don't know, an old Mac at least. Um, moreover, this Genymotion, for example, provides a set of pre-compiled, pre-available images for almost all uh, most diffused devices. So you can download the, the image for Nexus 7 or the image for the Samsung S4 and so on. So you can test your application with uh, a system which is actually, let's say, the copy of the real system. So you can expect uh, a more reliable behavior of the application. Okay, so that, that's the difference. So in the hand, for this end on, we use Java SDK, Android SDK, Android Studio, and Genymotion. Okay, many tools. What other additional tools we may need to develop uh, Android application? Um, well, we are developing application. We are probably giving to the application our own branded colors and so on. There are ways for doing this, but in general, if we are developing new graphics, new icons and so on, we need support tools. For example, one might be a graphic asset editor like GIMP, which is free. You can also use Photoshop or whatever so that you can create your own icons, for example. Another, which is really important in the design phase is something for uh, wireframing the UI. So if you are following a structured design approach, not the one we use today, is you need to start from, from the user needs for what to what to present to the user, to try to figure out what are the screens, what are the interaction, how can you move from one screen to the other, and that's named wireframing. You just design very scratchy the, the user interface on a paper, for example, and you can design the different screens and links between screens and annotate the, these designs with uh, uh, information about how can the user switch from one view to the other, what are the reactions, and so on. So that in the end, you can figure out how the application works. You can even test the application on paper with three, four, five simple users to, to check that everything is fine. And after that, you can start the real development so that you have a, a, a very defined guide for, for developing the application of just to put their code and end up uh, with what is called spaghetti code. Everything put inside more or less working. Okay, so for example, Pencil is one of those tools for wireframing. There are many of them. We not use that today. <laughs> okay, um, well, let's start. No, <laughs> let's wait a bit. Um, we could start now because we know almost everything we need, but um, let's be a little bit more uh, informed about how we should start. Uh, there are guidelines to uh, define effective Android applications. And differently from many other systems, in this case Google was really, really performant, and they provide a very comprehensive and clear and easy to use, let's say, set of guidelines to develop applications. And they started defining three basic principles which, uh, which needs to be followed to get a, a, an effective application, and they are the, uh, the enchant me, simplify my life, and make me amazing principle. Okay, they are quite commercial as a definition, but the idea is that enchant me means that any application complying with this guideline should be on one side uh, nice to see, okay, really you know interesting, cool, but should be also simple, it should be smoothless in use, so that you can just use the, the application without caring, without the learning nothing. You just open the application and use it, okay? So that's the first principle. Second, if you write an application, it should be written for the user. So it should be written for simplifying some aspect of the user life. 
not just by itself. So the application we are going to develop first is not a really good app because it's just for the sake of demonstrating how an app works. When you are starting to develop a real application, you need to take into account people first. That, that's their guidelines, at least. Um, the, la the last, which is make me amazing, the idea is that you have an application, you develop it for your user, it is fine, it is nice to see, it simplifies your life, but users should be able to invent new ways of using your applications. Maybe bridging with others. So the idea is that an application is no more self-contained. It's just a, you know, a, a point from which jumping and creating new user scenarios, new usages. And one classical example was, you know, you got the, initially you, you had the gallery application with the photos, and now almost all other application can show up the gallery, show up the machine, uh, the photographic machine of the, the phone to get you know, a photo and make something else. When they designed the, the, the photo part and the, the gallery, they perhaps didn't think about using those apps inside others, but still they are, okay? So the idea is that your apps should be reusable somewhat by other apps to enable new applications to be built. These are just design guidelines. To meet these guidelines, and we should see it, uh, Google defines uh, a set of design uh, tutorials, best practices, standard graphic elements, and ways to create standard graphic elements. Well-defined colors and palettes. The palettes of color is a set of colors which are uh, visually nice together, okay? Um, so for example, um, let me see if I can turn on the guide, just to get it. Damn. Mm. Do I have it? No. I could have it. <laughs> let me just connect to the Google network, if I can. Okay, let's see if we can. Oh, thanks, Polito. Just one second, otherwise you can check it by yourself. <laughs> um, let's cross the finger. Um, hmm. No way. Anyway, <laughs> if you go on the, the Google developer site, okay, um, don't know why it's not. not working. But if you go on the Google developer site, there is a design section. You go there and you find a lot of information about how to design the application. And there is one very useful section which is named uh, uh, pattern or successful patterns where they describe what are the uh, set of interactions like uh, having an home screen, how to pass from an home screen to another and so on and so on, which have been demonstrated successful uh, from the long-standing experience they, they had in developing. So basically they monitor the, the several applications on the market, they rank them, they, they look at the, the, at the rankings provided by the user, and they distill up the guidelines for developing applications which are successful. And this is really useful when you start from scratch because yeah, at least you have a, a, a nice guide to, to uh, start thinking about your application, okay? Um, okay, let me switch back to this one for the demo and, okay. What? Okay. 
Um, OK, let's go back. Let's start talking about application. Sorry, still a bit of slides, but we need to get the basics first, and they are long. Um, what is an application and how an application lives on, a, on a, an Android phone or an Android tablet? Um, in an ideal life, for um, making the you know, application switch really fast and effective, every application should, be, should reside in memory, should be already running and available. Okay, this would be ideal, because you can switch between a uh, running application in uh, almost zero time. But, but the problem is that we don't have unlimited memory on the device. We have big memories now, we have running devices with one gigabyte or two gigabytes of memory, but they are still limited. Therefore, whatever application we run on Android system can be at some time stopped by the system. So at some point, the system might decide that one application is taking too much memory, Perhaps the application is not shown on the screen, so the system decides that that application can be stopped. And this is a hint for saying that in Android, there is actually no explicit, let's say, start and stop of an application. There is a start, but there is no explicit stop. It's the system that manages the application life cycle and that decides when the application should be stopped. This might be on depending on the user input or not. Okay, you see it. For example, if you just go to the back button, open another app, go to the back button, and so on. And, and at some point, you you press on the on the button which has the multiple window icon. You see many apps open. They are open. They are alive. So if you click on them, they they just get uh, resumed. They are not stopped. Okay, because the system is still waiting for something to decide, okay, they can be closed. Um, so, uh, since basically we said that the applications are not stopped directly uh, by the user, but it's a system that manages the life cycle, there are five different states in which an application can be. An application can be in foreground, that means that it's running, it's alive, and is shown on the screen, and the user is interacting with the application, okay? In that case, it is in the foreground, and it has priority one. That means that it will never be stopped by the system unless something wrong happens, okay? Second status is visible. The application is there, it's still visible, but only partly. There is some, some other application which is overlapping and which is actually active. So the application is still there, its screen is visible, but it's performing not activity, basically. In that case, the priority decreases a bit. So if the system starts throwing out application because the memory is low, this visible application will be thrown out before foreground applications. After visible application, there are services, which are applications without user interface, like, uh, the service who listens for new mails, or the service who gets the position for uh, your GPS tracking system, okay? They do not provide any user interface, they just provide data. Uh, they can be stopped before the visible applications. Then going down to the to lower, uh, higher priority level, uh, sorry, lower priority indices, which means lower priority, okay? Um, we have background applications that are applications which have been stopped. So they have no active uh, activities, active parts, but they are kept in memory by the system to, to get a quicker restart when the user needs them. They are stored in what, what is called the last recently used list, okay? And they can be freely stopped whenever needed. So they are there, they are those uh, that you will see when clicking on the multiple window button, and they can be stopped at any time, okay? Um, finally, there is uh, the, the, the lowest priority state of an application that, which is empty. So the application is still in memory, but it has nothing active, no services, no background, nothing. So it is just a, 
uh, at the last step between being removed from the memory. And, uh, and of course, it will be the first one to be removed if the memory is getting low. Okay, what are the main components of our applications? Because until now, we just spoke about applications without many uh, precise terms. There are different, tool, different things that build up in applications. Uh, the main one, the one which uh, we encounter uh, as soon as we start developing, are the activities. What are activities? They are um, pieces of code that handle the um, one specific activity in the sense, one specific set of actions that the user might perform with the application and which are responsible of one user screen, okay? So they are both, they in, include both the definition of the user interface and the logic to handle the interface, okay? The intents are, as the name says, representing intentions of activities to do something. For example, they represent the intention of an activity to start another activity. When you switch the screen of your application, you basically define an intent to change the activity. Okay, that's a way, at least. Uh, but they may also define the intention to start a service. So you wrote a, a GPS tracking application, and as first you start the location service to get the GPS positions. Services. Services, we already said, are code set of classes that run in the background and provide data, which data depends on the service. Okay. But the idea is that they are like processes running on the background and providing information to the foreground applications. Um, okay, just still be very high level. Content providers, this is a, an Android specific abstraction. They decide, okay, um, in many cases, you need to handle the same data from different apps. For example, the mail, or for example, your contact in the, in the contacts uh, app. So you may, might need a contact for mails, might need a contact for calling someone, for getting someone on WhatsApp and so on. These content providers are a special kind of service, let's say, that provide interfacing methods for accessing the data. And they can be shared between different activities, between different applications. So if we have the content provider for the, uh, uh, I, I don't know, for the phone contacts you have, that provider is active and might serve different applications at the same time. So the, your mail application, your phone call application, your WhatsApp application, and so on. And that's the advantage, because you have just one content provider serving many applications that need that information. So the idea is that uh, instead of having each application handling its own information, when the information is common, there is a content provider that shares the information to all the application needed that, that data. Um, finally, broadcast receivers are all those components which allow um, to send messages that should be received by any application running on the uh, terminal. For example, the terminal is shutting down. When the OS sends the message, the terminal is shutting down. All the applications should shut down in some way. This is a kind of broadcast transmission. Um, resources, these are basically static files that are needed for making the application more beauty, more easy to use in different languages, and so on. So you have strings in different languages for giving uh, internationalized versions of the application. You have icons, you have uh, layouts, and whatever. These are static parts that each activity might, def might use or not. Yep. 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 It's an option. Yep. It depends on the application. <laughs> it's quite difficult to say. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, of course. But usually when you have a broadcast, then each receiver usually specifies a filter for getting, okay, I want to receive these broadcasts and not these others. So it, it might work without a, a, any risk or problem, actually. But, but then depends on the application. Maybe there are other ways for doing that, but uh, they are specific on your application. So we may talk about uh, in the lab, okay? Um, okay, so what is an activity? This is Play Music, okay? This is, Play Music is an app, and this is one of the activities of the Play Music part, okay? And it is an activity because it handles the, you know, the interaction and the visualization at the same time. Um, so when we click, for example, one of these icons and these pictures, then the activity behind intercepts the user click and decides what to do. For example, start the play activity, the one who plays uh, the album or not. Um, and it also handles the feedback. So when I click on it, for example, I get you know uh, a progress bar or a progress circle running saying, okay, I'm loading the, I don't know, the music, I'm downloading the file, and so on. Um, okay. So, uh, I haven't defined an app. If you, if you have noticed, I just spoke about components, always spoke about application without defining the application. Because the, the definition is quite blurry in Android. Uh, we can say that an application is a set of multiple activities, okay? So set of elements that would handle interaction and visualization which are loosely bound together. That means they, they work together, but they are not really bounded. So for example, I, I could have my application with an activity that runs the take a photo activity, which is an OS provided activity, basically, okay? And this can be done because they are loosely coupled. So my application is actually a set of different activities, part of which are developed by me, and part of others uh, developed by others perhaps also by Google, okay? Um, but that's why the application definition was in the end, because first we need to understand a bit what an activity is. Um, to start the application, we define what is called the main activity, which is the first activity to be run when the user clicks, touches the application icon. So when we touch the application icon, the main activity gets started. And the main activity is defined in this so-called application manifest that we are going to see in the few minutes. Um, what happens when an activity start, which is the last information we need? Whenever a new activity start, the previous one is stopped, and it is pushed in the so-called back stack. The back stack is the one we use when we press the back button. So when we start a new activity, the running one is pushed is stopped and put in, uh, into the back stack so that when we press the back button, we can get back the application, uh, let's say the activity running. Um, when we start the application and the application was already, was already running, it, has, it is taken from the back stack and uh, put in the foreground. Okay, let's go deep in the activity life cycle so that we can start with the first exercise. Um, this is the life cycle of one activity. What happens when I define an activity and run it? First, the system, when uh, we click on the, on the launcher icon, the system uh, launches the activity and calls this onCreate method. Okay, this is a function that the activity must define or can define. It's already defined actually implicitly. But in this function, usually the activity inflates the user interface. So creates the user interface to be shown to the user. After the creation, the application is started. So the, uh, the system calls this on start um, method for uh, performing some stuff. Afterwards, so there is this on resume, on a resume method, which is called basically when an application is put on the back stack and then the user returns back to the application. So in that case, we are performing this inner cycle where at some point the application is running, uh, sorry, the activity is running. Another activity becomes in the foreground because for example, the user opened another app, click on another app icon. 
In that case, our activity goes on pause, so we get this call on this on, on pause method. And when the user returns back to the activity, actually the life cycle goes here in the in the smaller circle. Okay? So you see the application, the, the activity isn't stopped or uh, destroyed or removed. It is still running, just changes the phases in which it's running. Okay? If we change the application and, so if we, if we switch the, the app and the screen of the app is no more visible, then the onStop method is called, so the application switches from paused to stopped, okay, so a different state. It is still active, but if the user navigates back to the activity, then the cycle is a little bit wider, because on the on restart method, for, for example, for reloading the data, for, for getting uh, exactly the interface exactly at the same point it was when the, the application was left, and then starts back on start and on resume and so on. Finally, when the application is finished, so it has done everything, which is usually happening, for example, when you resume the application, then start uh, pushing back until everything closes, no, no more is on the, on the stack when you, when you look at it, or you, you get the stack and you slide the application. In that case, the application is finished, and before finishing, it is called this on destroy method, which is used by the application for performing the final stuff before closing. Okay? So like saving any data it needs to save, cleaning any data structure it has in memory and so on. In the end, after this phase, the application is destroyed or stopped. Uh, not stopped, sorry, destroyed or finished. So it is no more available in memory, okay? And this uh, rarely happens. It depends on the application, but it really rarely. Um, okay, there, there might be another case where, for example, you kill a stuck application, or the application gets stuck because it has a long running uh, task, which is, in the, for example, in the main thread, and the OS detects that the application is taking too much time and asks you, would you like to kill this application? And you said, okay. In that case, this is the cycle. So the application is killed, and it restarts from the created method. Okay, so, okay, let's look at this unreadable code. <laughs> okay, you have it on the slide, we are going to, to, to write it, but basically this is just a summary of the methods we saw in the life cycle. So, uh, you know, uh, the code counterpart of that figure, when we see all the methods. Let, let's skip this, and let's start with uh, the first end-on, where the idea is to develop an Android application for showing this life cycle, for detecting it. And for detecting this, we just write a simple, empty activity with nothing inside, but we start exploiting one of the managers, which is the notification manager, to get a notification about the current state of the application, okay? And you have the sample code here. We can analyze it. Can, can you read it, more or less? Um, I, I can read it <laughs> and, and, and talk to you. Uh, the idea is that before writing it, let's just analyze the, the code. This is a method written in Java, which is a, a syntax which is different from Python, so sorry. If you are developing an Android application, you need to learn a different syntax, which is more like a C syntax, in a sense. Um, and basically this very simple method gets a string to show, which is for our case the name of the current state of the activity. Um, then it gets, with this line that says this dot get class dot get name, gets the full name of the program, of the activity, uh, class, okay? And the activity class is the set of lines of code 
uh, that gets executed for uh, for running the activity. Okay, so um, I can be more precise if you want, but it, it implies knowing what object programming is basically. So you can think the difference with with respect to PyPython is already a bit object programming based. If you if you remember when we create the UBridge class or uh, the all those classes we created in. Uh, uh, in the past lesson, they were actually uh, objects. So something which is, a, the, um, let's say, grouping uh, together data and the functions you need to work on that data. This is a class, basically. And the same is here. The activity is a class, so it's a set of data and functions you need to work on data uh, that makes an activity run. Um, in this case, we get the name of the activity class, which in Java syntax is something like, uh, for example, in our case would be it.polito.elite.demoapplication.myactivity, for example. That's the, that's the purpose of that code. Um, sorry, okay. Um, the second part is the creation it's for creating a new notification, so we get a tool which is provided by the by the framework, which is a, this notification builder that, as the name says, uh, uh, is used for building notification, and it uses a stream-based paradigm. That means, uh, like in jQuery, okay, you can call a method, and uh, the result you get is still a jQuery method, in, a jQuery object on which you can call the same method, and so on and so on. And the same happens here. You call the builder, and the result of the function call on the builder is still the builder, so that you can concatenate calls. Okay, it's a programming pattern. Um, but basically, what we did, we do in these three lines is to build the notification. So we set the title, the icon to show, and the message. Okay, the three lines there. Set content title, set some small icon, and set content text. Then afterwards, we got the notification ready. We need the notification to be delivered to the user. And to do that, we have one manager service provided by the system, which is the notification manager. So what we do is to get the notification manager, and we could do that by calling this get system service method, which is here, okay? So we want the system service named notification service. And this is the notification manager. We get it, and once we get it, we just call the notify function, notify method of that object, providing an integer, for example, the time at which a notification has been generated, and the notification. See, uh, having said this, uh, since the time is running, um, let's try to switch to development. So I, I'm running Android Studio. If it works, it takes a while. Yep. What is it? This means this object, the instance of the class uh, of which this method is part. It is usually adopted by experienced Java programmers to distinguish what are the inner variables and inner methods from the outer ones. So this means that uh, and this get class means take the class of this instance, of this object. And you can either uh, go further and, and have methods accepting parameters like uh, you know set name, string name, and then inside you can type this dot name equal name. That means the inner variable named name should be equal to the parameter provided to the method, which has the same name. Um, okay, then, um, let me go here. Um, close this, I don't care. Okay. Um, when you need to create a new app, we can do it, but let's start from, okay, we can do it. Um, or should I have an empty, okay, I have, this, it's the same. Usually do like this, new project, write the application name. So for example, 
life cycle test. Okay. You write here the company domain. For uh, in our example, it would be delight.polito.it in reverse order. The project location and it on next. You set up here the API compliance level. You see, for from 14 in my case, actually, sorry, it's lower. From Android 1, API 1, up to Android 22, which is the current one. Okay. Let's take just, uh, for example, KitKat. And the ID is saying, okay, now you are targeting almost 35% of devices. Okay, um, then I hit next. You can select uh, one template of uh, the many available. So let's say blank activity and hit on next. Then you are required to provide the name for the main activity, the one that gets launched when you click on the launcher. Let's say um, here tracer activity, for example, because we want to trace the activity lifecycle. <coughs> and it on finish. Okay, it starts building. Let's cross the finger. So now basically it's gathering all the information needed and generated all the, the structures uh, needed for an app to run. Um, and then if you're lucky, everything works. Okay, let's wait for the building. Okay, this is saying, okay, there are rendering problems because we are waiting for. If you're running the last Android Studio version, you are likely to get this, especially under Linux. So this is basically due to, okay, let me just build another time. But this is due to the fact that when you are supporting not the latest version, but starting from back, you need one or more libraries, which are called support libraries, that basically provide the code that needs to translate the newest UI elements, newest elements, to the old framework, okay? That's why this is complaining, because it's saying, okay, I'm missing the support library. So, if you need the support library, you can go this on, on this build.gradle part, which is the one that uh, basically handles the rules for building the application. And here you can specify another dependency saying I want to use the support library. Okay, let me just copy it because I cannot remember. It's something like, I can try it, but the, I'm not sure of the result, so then I will copy it. Should be com dot android dot support the app com slash compact slash v uh, this should be v four um, twenty one dot one dot one, let me check. And rebuild the project. Let's see if it's right. I don't remember if it's. Okay, you see down here, okay, you don't see, but I can tell you that down here there is progress bar saying, I'm building all the stuff and checking if everything is fine or not. And it takes a while because it needs to get the library, compile everything, and so on. One error, so, okay. This wasn't the right version, probably. My beats, let me check if I'm right. Otherwise, I would copy it. But if you get the, you know, the, the guide from the Android developer tools, it's there. No, unfortunately not. <laughs> okay, um, but I could wait. Okay. Oh. Oh, still one error. Okay, let me make it quicker. I can just switch to a project which is already 
Okay. Um, okay. Was this one, so that we can also see the same module. Okay, it was this one. <laughs> so the version is version 13.22.1.1. Okay, there are many of them, depending on the support libraries you need. If you go on the developer website, they list exactly the line you need to put in your code to get the compatibility, okay? So don't be scared if, as soon as you create the activity, it's already not working. It's weird in a sense, but uh, okay, we can manage it. Um, so let's go to the main activity, which is this one, which has already been uh, prepared for us. And you see here, in fact, it includes this support.v7.app and so on. When you see this, um, let me see if I can, I can at least enlarge that part. I don't know. I don't know how. Let me try with this, see if it works. It doesn't work. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, anyway, this, uh, line over the name of the activity means that this is deprecated. It is saying, okay, you can use it, but you should not use because it's old, okay? And the Android Studio is not updated for this in the sense that it keeps using templates with old tools. So we can just remove this and say activity. Now red means it's missing. So if I go there and please and press Alt plus Enter, I import the right one, which is this one, android.app.activity, and I can remove the gray line, which is no more used. Okay, now I got a pure activity, okay? Um, where did, is the activity interface defined? It is defined in this XML file, okay? So one of the properties of uh, an Android application is that interfaces are declaratively defined. You just define the layout uh, in XML and then inflate that layout when the application starts, okay? So the layout is here. You can also see it in the design part, very small, but I can, uh, okay, enlarge it a bit. Okay, so this is our really initial hello world. Okay, um, and for example here, let, let's, let me erase all these useless stuff. You can see here, for example, that there is already this onCreate method, which is the one that's, that gets called first when application starts. And you see, there are two instructions. One is super.onCreate that calls the, the framework, so the, the usual handling of the on create. And the second says, okay, the content view, so the, the, the interface to show for this activity is in the layout folder and it's named activity main, which is the, that XML file we just saw before. Um, so now what we can do here is to try to write uh, the code we, we have seen in the slides. So let me just write it um, for, we need to first generate, override. Here I'm saying, okay, I want to automatically generate the method that overrides, so that provide implementation for uh, the ones provided by the framework. And in this case, I want to get the on start, on restart, on resume, um, sorry, and then if I remember well, they were also on pause, on save instant state. Um, on stop, on destroy, see there are many of them. And they should be also on uh, Okay, I don't see it on restore. Okay. Let's start with those one. Okay. 
So the effect of this generate is that actually the IDE takes care of generating the base implementation of the methods. There should be also one, let me check if I can remember this. Uh, it's uh, um, protected. Right. On restore. Ah, damn. Okay, it should be suggesting. I think it's on restore, but let me switch back here so that I can list on restore instance state. Okay. Um, how did I? Okay, that's a combination. Okay. Take on. Restore instance state. Bundle restored state. And this will be super dot. Okay. We got it. Um, now, we have all the, the, you know, the life cycle methods. We want to write the notification part, so we need this method for any notification, so it will be private notify. Uh, takes a string, so string name, uh, stage name, let's call it, okay. Um, okay, this is void, okay. So you see the structure of the language is much more uh, precise than, uh, than in Python in a sense. Um, Notify, here we said, okay, we want to get the simple name of the class sending the notification. So we call it string name, equal to um, this dot get class get simple name. So this is the short name of the activity. Um, after this, we want to get the notification. We want to build the notification. So we start with notification our notification. notification with the uppercase letter is the class, and this notification written in a lower case is the instance, so the variable we are creating. And to do this, we get new notification dot builder. Okay, this dot. Set, we need to set the title. Ah, damn, it was, let me remember like this. Title is Content title, okay, sorry. Set content title. And we could put here as a title the name of the application, for example, or let's let's use the stage name. So stage name. Then I said we can use dot to get back the builder again. 
and add the additional parts. So I, I can use dot and try to convince the ID to let me call another thing, which is set content text. So the text inside the notification. So for example, name, the name of this class. And we can also set the icon. Um, the icon is r dot, I think it's mipmap dot IC launcher. Okay, so um, dot build. So this MIP, MIP map IC launcher is a folder here in the project. So you see resources, MIP map, IC launcher. This is the launcher icon which is generated by default. Whenever you generate a new icon, you get it here in this directory, either in MIP app or in resources directly, depends on, on, or in drawable, depends on the ID you are using. Okay, so finally. We got this, let's get the notification service. So notification manager, manager equal to uh, get system service, notification service. Um, This operator here, it's named a cast operator. That means, please be aware that this get system service returns a generic object, but this object is for sure a notification manager. So treat it like a notification manager. Um, okay, now that we have the manager, we can send the notification. So get the, the manager and send manager dot notify we need to provide an integer. Let's get the uh, current time from the system. So I need to just type here int uh, system dot current time midis. And the notification we want to send, which for us is containing the in the notification variable. Okay, got it. Now that we are ready, what we need to call to uh, to do to trace the activity lifecycle is just to call this notify method in every lifecycle related method we implemented. So starting from the beginning here, we can in the end type this dot notify stage name it's uh, on create. Okay. And here this dot notify stage name is on resume. And this will be on restart. be on start. Okay, a bit annoying. But on pause. This dot notify on save instance. This dot notify on restore. Okay. On stop. <coughs> and Destroy. Okay. 
So we got everything traced. Now, if you are lucky, we can just build. Should be already built. Okay. Okay, build was successful. Then we can start the emulator. So here I have this extension which is connecting to the Genymotion emulator. So I click on here. I got the list. In this case, I got a, a Google Nexus 7 image and a Samsung Galaxy X4. Let's take the Google Nexus 7. Start. Here you see the, the emulator starting. It takes a while for loading the, the virtual machine, basically. And here is the mobile phone starting uh, the Android. If we wait a bit, we will, oh, sorry. Even if, if if it should be, you know, quicker, not so quick. It needs to get started. Okay. Finally, we got it. We can unlock it. We, we got this mobile phone with everything. Okay. Um, should be here. Um, okay, let's go back. Um, okay, and now here, you see... This mobile phone is running and it's already connected to a kind of virtual network with this address. So if we need for some task to know the, the network address of the mobile, we can get it. Um, at this point, we can just sit on run. Wait a bit. <laughs> okay, uh, here the, basically what happens is that um, Okay, the Android Studio is finding the active emulators and asking us which one to use. This one would be Google Nexus, okay. And here we have our application. And if you see here, we have notifications, the one we generate. So if I go here and down, you see that has been called on create and on resume. Let us dismiss these notifications. And let's, for example, press the back button. You see here three calls, on pause, on stop, on destroy. Why on destroy? Because the, the, it was the only application I, I didn't switch to another. I just put the back button, nothing on the back stack. The application gets destroyed. That's one of the only cases in which the application gets destroyed. So let's start back the application. And it should be here in this one, okay? When I start the application from scratch, you see here, on create, on start, on resume. So we are following that life cycle part. And if instead of, you know, uh, closing the application, I just go to the home and run another application, for example, this one, okay? You see up here that on pause and on stop have been called, but the other application is still running, okay? So if now I get back and click on here, I get the two running applications. This one is running, and when I hit on it, I get the whole life cycle notification. So these two were the one called before. Now it's called on restart, on start, on resume. Okay. Okay, so that, that was the, the first part. And also the last, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but two things. First, you have on GitHub three different applications. Actually, I uploaded the, the, the whole uh, Android Studio project, so you should be able to just load it. And one is this one we developed together. The other is this one I can show you that basically shows how to start a new activity from a 
a main one, so it is this one in Tendimo, where you have just a button, and if you hit here, you get a new activity started. Okay, this is the second activity, and if I push back, I go to the, so this is just to show how you use intents to, to switch between activities. I was almost aware that we weren't able to get up to all the demonstrations, but sorry, <laughs> just one hour enough. Um, and the last one you have is this one I showed before, okay, which is a client for the REST server we developed in Python. About this, let me just uh, skip this for a second and open the code very, very, very quickly. I don't want to go in details. I would just, just want to point you to the interesting part, which is here. So to get this information, you need to place a REST call, which might be really long, because for example, the network might go down in between. And if you do that directly in the activity code, you will end up with the the OS is saying this activity is taking too much time, okay? Because long tasks should never be carried inside the main thread, inside the main process of an application. So for carrying these long tasks, there are several solutions. One of these is the asynchronous task. That basically is a task which gets executed apart and then reports back the result. You have here in, this, in the code of this app exactly one implementation of those uh, asynchronous tasks, which basically define three methods. One is on pre-execute, one on post-execute, and the other is doing background. Pre-execute means uh, do the stuff you need before executing. Doing background is the actual part in which your code gets executed, okay? And on post-execute is the part in which you deliver the result. So in this case, for example, here, in the background, what I do is to open an HTTP connection towards the server with the get method and get asks for all the tracks using the API. You can see there, I, I'm not going into detail, but you can see uh, on the GitHub, uh, Git, GitHub source code how I can I do it. And if you have any question, just ask me either by mail or in the lab. Um, so what I do here is to just get the JSON from the, the Flask server and once I get this JSON in the post-execute method, call the main activity saying, okay, I've loaded the track, you can display them. Okay, so that's the, 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 the usual way of working for longer tasks. You run them in background and then you get back the result when they are ready. Okay, and finally, if we still have time and if this is still working, let me check the API address of this stuff. One hundred oh nine. So, okay. Let me cross the finger. Um, okay, is it there? I'm sorry. So here. Okay, it is still one oh nine. Oh, okay. Now we got this, this is the app running on the real phone, okay? And if I just take one, I don't know why. And so here we are performing the put request on the real server in Python running here. And you see here this, this, oh. okay, sorry, <laughs> this is, the information we got back, which is a, a, the detail. Let me see if I can get, okay. It's the detail about the current track. And if I beat it back, I can, you see there's, there's a time lag, which is the time needed for sending the request and getting back the data. But the application gets, is not blocked and uh, is not stopped by the system because the task is run uh, synchronously. Okay, and then you got the whole list and you can switch on and over. Okay, and this you can try it because we have both the server and the app code on the, on the GitHub. Okay. Okay, that's almost everything.
Well, if you have any question, um, ask. <laughs> Otherwise, we can just close the last one and see you on next week. Actually, on next week, uh, there will be my colleague because I'm not here, but I will be available on the week after. Or if you have some urgent question, just write me, I can uh, answer. Because I'm not in Italy for, uh, because I have to go away for the work, but I can respond to mails. <laughs>